Hey guys, Bartel's Bookshelf here, uh, and today uh, I'm going to be talking about three Star Trek books that I've recently finished. As any of you know, who've, if you've been watching my last few videos, I've been really getting into <laughs> Star Trek books. Uh, I think I'm on my sixth one now, <laughs> currently. But I thought it would be fun, you know, because uh, I've been reading these so quickly. Um, I'll just do um, a little a little Star Trek roundup of some of the books that I've finished recently, uh, and hopefully if I keep this up at the same pace that I've been going at, then this will become an ongoing series. We'll see. <laughs> and obviously I'm still going to do individual reviews for like certain books that stick out and stuff like that. But today I'm going to talk about these three. The Final Reflection by John M. Ford. Planet X by Michael Jan Friedman. Yes, that is what you think it is. And the novelization of the first episode of The Next Generation, Encounter at Farpoint, by David Gerald. So let's start with the final reflection. Uh, so this is actually a pretty interesting book. So this is about a, a Klingon uh, captain or a Klingon named Kren who starts out as um, sort of a, 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 a he's he's unnamed. He has no family, but he's really good at this game called Klinja, which uh, which is like uh, sort of the Klingon version of chess, um, but with live players. Because he's so uh, proficient at that, he gets. Um, adopted into another family by this guy named uh, Kethas Epitai Kemara. I had to take notes. <laughs> and he ends up becoming part of uh, that, that guy's family. And um, the book kind of just follows his, um, his early life and um, his uh, experiences working as a, uh, a, Kling, a, a sort of Klingon diplomat to the, uh, the Federation. As I said, this is a really interesting book. This was uh, written by John M. Ford, who was a very well-respected uh, sci-fi and fantasy author. He wrote um, books like The Dragon Waiting, which was recently put out by, uh, reprinted by Tor. Neil Gaiman uh, is an avowed fan. So I was really looking forward to this. And yeah, I, I, I did really enjoy it. One of the interesting things about it is that it's almost sort of of like meta metafictional because the final reflection is actually the name of a novel within the universe of the book um, about Captain Kren. It's the story of the book about Captain Kren, and so there's this um, this wraparound story um, with uh, Kirk and uh, and McCoy and everyone where they've uh, they've uh, this book has just come out and they've all read it and um, the Federation you know ha has has said you know oh well it's fiction but Kirk uh, is given it by McCoy to read and so that that forms the the basis of the book of the Trek novels I've read so far this is probably the most well written and just on a prose level there's some really just shrewd uh, metaphors in here some some nice prose. Um, I enjoyed how it played with sort of the metafictional angle, and I also thought it was pretty ballsy, especially for an early Trek novel, in focusing pretty much entirely on the Klingons. We don't uh, we don't see a thing of the original crew except in the wraparound, and there is a cameo from uh, a young Spock and from um, McCoy's uh, grandfather. So there are like a few things here and there, but it's not overly reliant on sort of references and fan service. Um, it actually stands on its own as a pretty interesting Klingon book. Of course, a lot of since this was written in 1984, um, a lot of it isn't canon now, but a lot of the ideas that um, that were brought up in this book were the basis for um, later uh, Klingon ideas, like you know their, their devotion to honor, their interest in games. I believe um, uh, Ronald D. Moore, um, who was a very prominent writer on the later Star Trek shows um, and went on to create Battlestar Galactica, the reboot, um, said that this was actually a big inspiration for him when he was um, writing the Klingons because he kind of became Star Trek's resident Klingon writer during that time. Um, so yeah, this is a very influential book, and um, I really, I just really liked. Um, there was just a lot of interesting details about the Klingon world that I really enjoyed. Um, there's this thing called Komarex Ja, which is the the perpetual game, which is this Klingon idea that um, all of life is a game. All of life is, you know. You know, you're you're playing chess every moment of your life, basically. Every every time you you exist in the world, everything you do, it's all part of the perpetual game. And we learn some Klingon ideas about the afterlife, like the Black Fleet, which is um you know a, an eternity in a uh, locked in combat with a uh, you know. Klingon fighters and, and Romulans and stuff. As I said, a lot of uh, ideas that were eventually developed and followed up on in the actual shows, of course, in a different way. But I could definitely see how this was an influence on um, the Klingon world in general. And apparently, this actually was kind of the Klingon Bible for a while, in that uh, it actually served as an influence on the uh, the early uh, role-playing um, volumes and things like that. And apparently, it's a very popular sort of alternate universe role-play for people who are into that stuff. So yeah, it was an interesting book. I did have a few great with it. Um, I thought the length left something to be desired. I mean, a lot of these Star Trek books are pretty short. This one's about 250
153 pages, which I mean, he fits all of the stuff into the story pretty pretty neatly in, in within that small amount. But um, because of that, it feels very rushed as well. And I would have liked to have seen more development of Kren as a character and his um, sort of slow realizations about sort of the the, the realities of living as a Klingon and and, and working with humans. Uh, there was a lot of really interesting uh, back and forth uh, with the human ambassador named Emmanuel Tagore, differing philosophies and uh, combative, interesting philosophical stuff like that that Star Trek is always really good at. Um, the differing of the differing cultures and things like that. Um, there was one bit that I really really liked where um, Tagore is teaching Kren poker. He's like, oh, well, we don't have any like real stakes, you know, we don't have anything to play with. And uh, Tagore has this huge like personal library on on, on the ship. And um, Tagore takes one of the books and he, and he holds it over the incinerator and he's like, you know, if you lose, I'll burn the book. Tagore ends up winning, but he gives um, Kren the book and he says, you know, like, what if I what if I destroy it anyway? You know, and he's like, you may destroy it if you want to. It's your book now, but you know, then then it, then it won't have anything. You it won't have anything to teach you. You won't be able to listen to it. And I just thought that was a really beautiful sort of um, treatise on the on the love of books and of learning. And you know, I just I really liked that. <laughs> but but I, I would have liked to have seen that stuff expanded on more. I would have liked more more density, more complexity. Complexity. Um, I get it's a tie-in book. There's only so much you can do. But my only other real issue with the book was that a lot of it can be kind of inscrutable. There's a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of sort of betrayals and double crosses and sort of uh, spies and um, subterfuge and, and hidden plans. And there's so many characters, like just sort of minor characters that kind of shift in and out of the narrative that after a while I just kind of got totally lost and I didn't really know who anybody was aside from, you know, the main players. I, when I finished the book, at first I wasn't really sure what even happened necessarily, like what the big sort of uh, twist was and why everybody was sort of freaking out. Um, but after ruminating on it and, and reading about it on, on the Star Trek wiki, I, I sort of understood it better. And it, it was a really, really interesting story. It was just th those things made it a little bit hard to follow, a little bit inscrutable. But it was definitely really, really um, rewarding um, as a Star Trek fan. Um, if you really like Klingons, like this is kind of the first real like major Klingon book, um, as far as I understand it. I mean, as I mentioned, it's, it was widely influential. Um, there's also a follow-up. Well, not really a follow-up, but it's another Klingon novel written by John M. Forward called uh, How Much for Just the Planet. I have that one too, and I, and I eagerly look forward to reading that one, so I'll let you know how that is when I get to it. So yeah, that was uh, The Final Reflection by John M. Ford. Next, I read Star Trek The Next Generation and X-Men Planet X by Michael Jan Friedman. And yes, this was a Star Trek TNG and X-Men crossover, uh, published in 1998. Um, this was actually a follow-up to um, two crossover comics. One, there was a Next Generation one, and there was an original series one in 1996, I believe, because there was a brief uh, partnership between Paramount and Marvel where they were putting out um, comics and things like that. And this is a, a result of that. The interesting thing about that is that this is actually a direct sequel to the first uh, Next Generation crossover. Um, of course, that doesn't really mean much in terms of continuity. It just means they don't really have to spend time introducing the characters to each other. Um, but this is this one is about a, a planet uh, a planet in Jao Dia, where um, basically uh, p citizen, random citizens um, on the planet start turning into mutants. And around that time, uh, the X-Men, of course, somehow mysteriously teleport into um, the Next Generation universe. Uh, where they meet up with Captain Picard, who they mention having known before in a previous adventure, and they have to work together to figure out what to do about these mutants. And it basically serves as sort of a uh, Star Trek exploration of the same themes that we've seen over and over again in X-Men. And to be honest, I thought this one was kind of disappointing. I, I, I was I bought it I bought it and read it solely based on the premise. I mean, an X-Men Star Trek crossover that sounds like fun as fuck, doesn't it? And it was for for a little while. The first like half of the book is just nothing but fan service and I, I as someone who enjoys both X-Men and Star Trek I really enjoyed that it, it was really fun honestly the best parts of the book were just uh, when all the crew were kind of like getting to know the individual X-Men and stuff the sort of little character interactions going on there there's a bit with um, Jordy and uh, Nightcrawler where um, Jordy's all obsessed with like studying Nightcrawler's teleportation ability and he finds out uh, uh, that basically the, the energy that Kurt uses to teleport is like similar to what they use for their warp drive and stuff like that. There's a scene where Worf and Wolverine uh, go into the holodeck together and they do this like crazy like battle simulation and they come out afterward and they're all like beaten and bloodied and they're, they've just got their arms around each other and they're like laughing and joking, you know. Picard is like 
kind of macking on uh, on Storm. He he's clearly like hella interested in her, and she's like talking to him, and he's like all he's he's like he's like a nervous schoolboy. He's like you know I'm very interested by you, uh, by you and your team. You know he's like stammering and stuff, and it's just just stuff like that, like just little character interactions that are just really entertaining and that make the book like uh, really fun to read for a while. Where it lost me was in the latter half when it starts focusing more on the Jaldia storyline, which was okay, but ultimately is really as I said just kind of a Star Trek reflection of X-Men themes, you know, about prejudice and bigotry and things that we've seen over and over again in the comics, and they're just kind of, like, regurgitating a lot of the same talking points, like, not really finding anything new to do with them. One of the things that I did like is on, on Jaldea, on this mutant planet, they start, um, sort of corralling the mutants into, um, into this old, like, temple and sort of a, sort of like a concentration camp kind of thing. But one, one of the things that I thought was interesting was that, um, the leader of the, of the Jaldean government was actually very, like, um, he wasn't like Senator Kelly in X Man or something like that, you know, where he's just very like vociferously anti mutant and hateful. He comes off like a like a good man doing a bad thing because he thinks it's the best it's the best uh, course of action. And that was a little bit of sort of character depth that I really liked. But ultimately the Jaldean stuff just kind of feels like a regurgitated X Men story, and uh, I just didn't uh, I didn't find the villain that compelling. It was just kind of a rip off of Magneto, um, but he can control Earth instead of magnets, you know. And the last half of the book kind of just devolves into just like endless action scenes and like spouting techno babble, and not so much the interaction between the the different characters, which was what intrigued me about this in the first place. It's just kind of, it just kind of turns into just an X Men comic, a, a, a generic X Men comic where they're you know they're fighting bad guys and. They don't really do anything new or interesting with it, so that was honestly kind of disappointing. But, you know, it wasn't terrible. It was competently written. Um, some of the character interactions were fun. I didn't hate it. And, and as I said, there's a lot of fan service. Like, they even mentioned, you know, the, the Picard maneuver, how he's always grabbing his shirt and jerking it down like that, you know. Little things like that. So if, you, if, you, if you're really a huge, huge fan of both of these franchises, then you'll probably like this. Or at least have a decent time with it. You know, it's, it's, it's a decent way to pass the time. Didn't hate it, but it, I, I just thought it could have been more than it was and been a little bit more crazy or a little bit more entertaining a little bit more um just em embraced the ridiculousness of its concept more you know i would have liked to have seen that but yeah so that was planet x by michael jan friedman and then finally i read the novelization of the first next generation episode encounter at farpoint by david gerald as many uh trek fans have noted many you know time and time again the first season of next generation was rough it was pretty damn bad. Um, there were tensions on set, um, disagreements between Gene Roddenberry and the writing staff. There were disagreements between the writing staff and Roddenberry's lawyer, who was kind of like um, moseying his way into things, kind of worming his way in and, and, and changing things, you know, without anyone's approval. The first season was just a fucking mess. It was it was it was uh, inconsistent with its tone. Um, it didn't really know how to sort of. Um, take things into a new direction um, rather than just kind of regurgitating um, original series plots. So I was interested to, to check this out because, you know, one, it's it's the first episode. It's kind of, the, and this is the, the first, like, next generation book pretty much ever written. Um, so I was curious kind of how did it, com how did it feel how were they treating it um, at the beginning of the series compared to now, where we're more familiar with the, the characters and the universe and stuff? And yeah, it, it was actually pretty interesting. The episode itself isn't great, and the book doesn't really do a whole lot to improve that. It's still just kind of eh. But it does have um, the introduction of Q, um, and of course all of the characters meeting for the first time, so it is entertaining to read from that perspective. But you would obviously know that if you had watched the episode. What made the book interesting for me was that it had sort of little um, expanded bits and character moments that they couldn't do in the original episode. Um, with McCoy's cameo, you get a little bit more of a um, backstory on kind of why he's at the why he's visiting the Enterprise, how he got there, um, sort of his his feelings, um, seeing the new Enterprise for the first time, and. And uh, his interactions with Data, you know, is a little bit expanded upon, and, and that's really entertaining. In general, you just get a little bit more backstory on, on a lot of the characters than you did in the show, which I really enjoyed. Um, one of the things that that, interest, that, that intrigued me, because it, it took Next Generation a little while to find its footing, but what in intrigued me about the book especially is that it was pretty, like, solidified with all the character relationships and stuff. Like, a lot of the stuff in here obviously changed compared to the first season and compared to the later seasons. It, it actually um, seemed to kind of... Uh get at the character relationships um, pretty well, I thought. Wesley's still an irritating shitbag, <laughs> but we all knew that. 
Um, there's actually a pretty uh, funny bit where, you know, there's obviously there's this, there's the scene in the episode where Wesley is, like, going onto the bridge and futzing with the computers and stuff. But we get a little bit more of a Picard's perspective in this about how, like, he just doesn't like kids and he's, like, just confused and, 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 and scared by them in a way, you know. And, and he has no idea, like, how to how to interact with Wesley. That was pretty entertaining. Um, like I said, ju- just, just little things like that that... Um, that make it interesting. I, I don't think it was essential, but if you're like a Star Trek completionist, it was a pretty entertaining read. And obviously, David Gerald is uh, has you know a lot of creds. He wrote the uh, the, tr- the original Tribbles episode and the original series. He worked a little bit for uh, Next Generation, but then left for contentious reasons. Part of the behind the scenes shit that I mentioned be- previously. And he's an accomplished sci-fi writer in his own right. He wrote like The Man Who Folded Himself, The Alien, uh, The Martian Child, I think it's called. It wasn't an amazing book, but I mean it it was. Well, it was competently written, it got all the character relationships across, and there were enough little sort of extra bits and bobs that I thought it was a fun read. I, I, I had a good time with it, and it's short. It's only like 192 pages, so I finished it off in like a day. So, yeah, that was um, the novelization of Encounter at Farpoint by David Gerald, and that was my final uh, Star Trek book for this little mini Star Trek wrap-up. Um, so if you enjoyed, let me know. Um, have you read any of these? What did you think of them? Um, if you know of any Star Trek books that you think I'll like, please recommend it to me. I have a ton, especially pre- um 2000s, you know, the relaunch stuff. I have a ton of, like, original series novels. I have a a good chunk of Next Generation novels, so, like, if there's any of those that you really, really like and recommend, let me know. But until then, uh, I'll uh, I'll keep reading more of these Trek books, and uh, I'll continue going where no reader has gone before. So, until then, live long and prosper. (laughs) Bye!